This morning, I want to begin by asking a very simple question. Now, Steve, this isn't uh, anything you've got to worry about here, but um, I want you to look at this pew, and I want to ask you the question, aside from Steve, why is this pew empty? Now, that's a rhetorical question. That's not designed for you to say anything right at the moment. I want you to think about it, though. You know, Steve very well could have been sitting right there. He could have been sitting over there. As we look across the congregation here, I see two people right there in that pew and one person in that pew. Now, I know some of you may be saying, well, this pew is empty because nobody likes to sit on the front row, Brother Rod. Well, I understand that. Or you may be saying, we've got a lot of depressed people. Georgia got beat pretty bad yesterday. At the end of the sermon, though, we're going to hear what the real answer is. This morning's sermon is titled, All Things to All Men. It's based upon 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, verses 19 through 22. If you have your Bibles, I want you to open to that passage of Scripture. We're going to look at that here in just a few moments and be reading it, so I want you to have that in front of you. Now, just a few weeks ago, I went to an evangelism conference that was sponsored by our Valdosta Baptist Association. Now, I've gone to these kinds of evangelism conferences many times over my career. And, you know, in the past, whenever I've gone to these evangelism conferences, the speakers who are well-trained individuals with regards to our state convention, they usually somewhere in the seminar make a statement similar to this. They will say, 80% of our churches are either plateaued or declining. Now, you understand what that means, right? That means of of our Southern Baptist churches, 80% of them are either not growing at all or they are shrinking. But this time... They said something different. These leaders of our convention got up in front of us and said, Men, our churches are dying. That's very different from what they have said previously. They said, Our churches are dying. Now, folks, this is troubling, especially those of us who know Scripture, because we know that in the Bible, Jesus said to you and me who are believers, Go and make mature disciples. Amen? Did he not say that? Amen. He said that. So if Jesus said that's what we're supposed to do, yet we are not just plateaued or declining, but we are dying, that's troubling. Here's the good news. The Bible tells us how to reverse that. Uh, The bad news is that it means that we have to do something that none of us like to talk about, change. If you've got your Bible open to that passage of Scripture, we're going to look at it here together. Here in the ninth chapter of 1 Corinthians, verses 19 through 22, Paul speaks to us and says to us today what he would do in order to make sure that he keeps the main thing the main thing. What's the main thing? For Paul, it was making uh, the presentation of the gospel in such a way where a lost person could respond to it and become a believer in Jesus Christ. But listen to what Paul says he does in order to hit that target. Starting at verse 19. For although I am free from all people, I have made myself a slave to all in order to win more people. To the Jews I became like a Jew to win Jews. To those under the law like one under the law. Though I myself am not under the law to win those under the law. To those who are outside the law, like one outside the law. Not being outside God's law, but under the law of Christ, to win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak in order to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that I may by all means save some. Now let's make sure that we understand what this text says, and we don't have to spend a lot of time because it's pretty simple. First of all, uh, Paul did not say... In order to win people, I would engage in sinful activity. In other words, he did not say to the thief, I became a thief. He didn't say that. Everybody with me on that? But what he did say, he did say, no matter who I'm talking with, whether it's a Jew, whether it's someone under the law, whether it's someone weak, I found common ground with them so that I could present the gospel to them. So that they, some of them, would respond to that and make a decision to trust Christ. A few years ago, 
I decided to find out what, what the excitement was with all these video games, so I bought myself a PlayStation a few years ago. I thought, you know, everybody's playing these video games. What's the, what's the big draw here? So I bought a PlayStation, and it came with a fishing game. And, I, you know, I'm a man. I didn't read the instructions. I just plugged it in and started playing. So, you know, I'm, I'm fiddling with the buttons and all that kind of stuff. And in the fishing game, you know, you could, you could select a fishing pole and a lure, and you could select a lake, and you could just you could learn how to throw that lure out into the water. And I figured out how to do all that stuff, and I started pressing all those buttons and everything. But you know what? I didn't catch a single fish. I thought, these video games aren't much. And then all of a sudden it happened. A voice out of the TV speakers said, hey, if you're fishing for walleye, you might want to change your lure. So I started pressing buttons until I changed my lure. And then I threw that out there with my buttons, and I caught a walleye. Now listen, folks, I realize that people aren't fish. And you know that too. And I realize... That evangelism is not a game. But surely, on the very most elemental level, we can allow that to say something important to us when it comes to hearing what Paul has to say. I've become all things to all people that I might win some. Listen, folks, we don't want to change the message, but we may have to change our lure. We're going to put this up on the screen because it's pretty important. This puts it in a nutshell. The church must minister to our culture without compromising the message. Amen? Now, I want you to look at that statement. There's two important truths in there. First of all, the church must minister to our culture. You know what some churches have done, and they're reaping the negative benefits of it? Some churches have said, you know, our society, our world is so bad that we're not even going to get in the midst of it. It, we're just going to close ourselves in. We're going to let the, the, the community know, hey, our doors are open. If you want to come in, come in. But we're not going to get out there in the community. And they have reneged on the fact that the church must minister to the culture. Jesus made that very plain. Inevitably, that church will die. But you know, there are other churches that take the other truth that's up there, and, and they compromise it too they say hey we're ready to go out into the world we're ready to go out into the culture we're ready to rub shoulders with lost people but you know what they've done they've taken the unchanging gospel of the message of jesus christ and they've changed it they have made their worship services a circus they've taken central truths of the gospel of jesus christ and they said well that really doesn't matter to this people group or that people group and you know what's going to happen folks they may draw a crowd but they are not making disciples the church must minister to our culture without compromising the message of Jesus Christ. You know, I don't know about you, but I, I think it's time for our churches, and for us, we're one of them, to stop moaning about how bad this, this world is getting and realize that is our mission field. Now, that may mean that we're going to have to change the method we communicate the gospel, but we will do it without changing the message of the gospel. Does that make sense to you? You know, folks, when we look at this passage of Scripture, Paul was, was saying something very simple. He was saying, depending on who I'm talking to, I'm willing to change my method of communication of the unchanging message of the gospel. We can't look at this passage of Scripture without thinking about change, folks. So let's talk about change for a few moments. In fact, let's talk about things that never change, all right? Let's talk about some things that never change. These are the building blocks of our belief and our practice as believers in Jesus Christ. Here, here's something that never changes, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Folks, that never changes, amen? Just listen to this. You don't have to turn here. Hebrews, the 13th chapter, verse 8. It says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Amen? We can go to Malachi, the third chapter, and God says of himself, he says, I do not change. Now, when we look at this, folks, I want to make sure you understand, it doesn't matter what we think about the gospel of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter how we live our lives about the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ will never change. We don't have the power to change it. It stands immovable, imperishable. 
Now, when we look at this Hebrews 13, 8 verse, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. You know what that tells us? That tells us that we can count on Jesus. He is reliable. He is trustworthy. And if we follow that up with other passages of Scripture, and we don't have time to do that, we also come to the realization that Jesus came into the world as the Savior of the world. He is the only means of salvation. Jesus said it himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, folks, listen. It doesn't matter what we think about that statement, how we feel about that statement. Jesus said it, and it's true, and it will never change. The only hope for salvation for you is a right relationship with Jesus Christ. The only hope for salvation for your family is a right relationship with Jesus Christ. The only hope of salvation for this community is a right relationship with Jesus Christ. It never changes. Here's another thing that doesn't change. The reason Jesus came. The reason that Jesus came. Matthew, the 10th, I mean Mark, the 10th chapter, verse 45. Don't go there. Just listen. This is Jesus himself speaking about himself. And he says this. For even the Son of Man, that's him, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Folks, we can find no more reliable definition of why Jesus came than that. Why did he come? He said to give my life as a ransom for many. What does that mean? It means he is going to pay the price for sin and buy people out of the chains of sin and redeem them so that they can have eternal life in him. Now, he said, that's why I came. Jesus didn't come to sell books, folks. Jesus didn't come to endorse your pet agenda or your private desires. There is one purpose and one purpose alone for the fact that God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, into the world to live some 33 years, perhaps, to go to the cross and die on the cross, to be resurrected three days later, and to ascend to the Father in heaven. There was just simply one purpose and one purpose alone, and that is to help lost people come to know Him personally as Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. That's the only reason he came. And folks, that will never change. It doesn't matter how we think about it or how we live our lives in respect of it. That's why he came. And it causes us to say this. Just because you're saved and I'm saved doesn't mean that Jesus' work is done. Now here's something else that never changes. The purposes of the church. Now what are the purposes of the church? Evangelism, discipleship, fellowship, ministry, and worship. Those are the purposes of the church. And you know what? They never change. Now, it doesn't matter how we feel about the church, and even it doesn't matter how we allow church to sometimes spin out of control. That's what the church is here to do. Now, you can tweak that and add some words or take some words away. It doesn't really matter. Basically, that's what the church is here for, those five things. But this is what I want you to consider. I want you to look at those five things that are listed up there. You know, we could do four of those things extremely well, and maybe one of those not so well, and by and large, we'll still survive as a church. In other words, let me say this. Let's just pick out one. Let's just say fellowship. Let's say we do evangelism, discipleship, ministry, and worship, and we do those excellent, but we don't do a real good job of fellowship. You know what? The church will survive if that happens. And you can put another three up there, and the same is true. We might not do one of those very well, but if we do all the rest excellent, we'll survive. But listen, there's one of them up there that makes a difference. If we do worship, fellowship, ministry, and discipleship excellent, but we do a poor job on evangelism, the church will die. Amen or oh me. Now, folks, that helps us to understand that while those are the five purposes of the church, and again, you can tweak that in any way where you want, five, six, you can make it seven, whatever, it does tell us that there's a priority. And that priority is in line with the reason that Jesus came. And, folks, these are things that never change. Well, we've talked about that. Let's talk about some things that always change, okay? Some things that always change. 
again, it doesn't matter how you feel about this. These are things that always change, whether you like it or not. And here's the first one. It's very closely related to the second one, and you'll see the relationship here in a moment. But the first one is people. People always change. Now, I know there are some of you who are saying, I've got somebody in my life, I've been trying to get him to change for years, and he's never done it. I understand that. But what I'm saying is this, this, in a more broad way, we as people change. There is a developmental process. I am not physically the same person I was 40, 50 years ago. Listen, folks, Terry and I went into the Dairy Queen last week. We decided we'd get the five-buck lunch deal. You you know what I'm talking about, right? Five bucks for lunch. And and I'm pretty good with math. It's me and her. That's two. That's five plus five. That's ten. So with tax, it's going to be ten dollars and some change. So I pull out of my wallet a ten-dollar bill and a dollar bill, and I'm ready to pay for that. The little girl behind the register, she rings all that stuff up, and she looks at me, and she says, that's nine dollars and sixty-three cents. And I was about to say, no, no, you're wrong there. I know. I mean, I can add five plus five is ten, but all, all of a sudden it hit me. And it's hitting you. She not only gave me the senior adult discount, she didn't even ask if I was a senior. Now, how did she know? Look, in my mind, I don't know about you, but in my mind, when I'm walking around, I've got brown hair. And I don't have this spare time. I'm 135 pounds like I was when I was 27 years old. What we're trying to drive at is this, folks. People do change emotionally, mentally, even spiritually. Let's, let's say it this way. Perhaps the most important thing that we're, we need to talk about when we talk about people changing is their values. Folks, if I today thought was important, what I thought was important back when I was 20 uh, you, you'd, you'd question whether or not I even needed to be pastor here. There are things that when I was 20 years of age, I thought they were extremely important, but you know now, they're not important to me at all. I mean, I'd have a 65 Barracuda with Craigers on it out there in the parking lot. It'd be jacked up and have dual exhaust and all that kind of stuff. Man, I'm not fussing at you. If you're a hot rod enthusiast, that's fine. Don't, I'm not getting at you. But our values change. Listen, we can talk about baby boomers and baby busters and Gen X and millennials and all that kind of stuff, and that's valuable information, but the upshot of all of that is this. Generationally, we differ. There are things that those of you who are baby boomers, like me, your value system is very different from a 20-year-old or a 30-year-old. We have to endorse that. We have to embrace that. It's reality whether we like it or not. People change. Here's something else that always changes, and it's very closely related to that. It's society. Because these are so closely related, I mean, you can't talk about society without talking about people, but there's enough of a difference here that I think we need to talk about it. Our society is constantly changing. You know, folks, I don't know about you all, but things are changing in our society. You've noticed that, and it it seems as if it's very rapidly changing. You know, just about the time, someone has said this, just about the time we think that this very thing right here cannot be done, we hear about somebody over here actually doing it. Our work, the way we work has changed. The way we transport ourselves has changed. Anybody here glad that you're not coming here on a covered wagon pulled by a mule? I don't know, maybe you would want to do that, that's fine, that's your thing. But the way we travel, the way we communicate has changed. I want to ask how many of you are old enough to remember that you knew it was time to go to church because you heard the bell ringing. Anybody remember the bells being rung before church service? And folks, you know this to be true. With regards to society, our view of morality has changed. Boy, it just makes you wonder when these senseless killings are going to stop, doesn't it? Society changes, whether we like it or not. And I'll just be honest, folks. Wishing for the good old days does absolutely no good. 
And I, I hate to b burst your bubble, but they're not coming back. They're not. Society constantly changes. Now, don't let this next one throw you. Listen very carefully. Here's something else that changes all the time. God's activity. Now, listen, I didn't say God. I said God's activity. God's activity is always changing. It's always evolving. And we don't have to go any further than the Bible to see that this is true. The very beginning of the Bible says that before the universe existed, there was nothing. There wasn't anything here. But you know what? God changed that by creating the universe. If we go a little bit further in the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, we find out you know, humanity got so evil that God said, I've got to change that. You know what he did? He sent a flood and killed everybody but one family. Now let me ask you something. Did, did God at that point say, and from now on, whenever humanity acts up, I'm going to send a flood and kill everybody but one family? Is that what he did? No, he didn't keep it that way. He changed that. And he said, I'm going to reveal myself through a particular family. I'm going to start here with Abram, who later became Abraham. And he said, I'm going to make them into a great nation, and I'm going to bless other nations, and I'm going to reveal myself to the world through this people. That's a change. But you know what? Even that changed. Because God sent his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross, to do away with a sacrificial system that needed sacrifices every day, and to say, my son Jesus is going to make a sacrifice once and for all, and by placing your faith in him, you will be saved. That was a change, folks. God's activity is constantly changing and evolving to help lost people come into the world, come into the kingdom come into God's rule and reign. So we come to the $64,000 question. We've talked about some things that never change. and we think, We've talked about things that always change. So how do we bring these two together? Here's the question. How do we bring the unchanging message of the gospel to an ever-changing world? How do we do that? And folks, this is the question that every church on the face of the planet has to wrestle with. If they don't, they're not being faithful to the call of being a church. How are we going to bring the unchanging message of the gospel to a world that's constantly in motion, constantly changing? Now folks, I, I don't, I'm not going to stand up here and say I've got all the answers. But I think there's some things that we can say basically that will lay a foundation for us to be a church that's making a difference in the kingdom. I think there's some things that are required. And first and foremost, it will require a commitment to Jesus Christ. Listen, folks. <laughs> I've been in churches, and you have too, where after a little bit of time, you can walk up to somebody in the church and say to that person in that church, hey, who's in charge of this church? Who runs this church? And they're liable to point to that older fellow over there or that older lady over there or point to that family right there or point to the deacons or point to the pastor and they say they run the church can I tell you something the most important person in the church is Jesus Christ the second most important person in the church sitting in the church is the lost person all the rest of us are third the church that says, without hesitation, the, the person that's in charge of this church is Jesus Christ, that church will never be confused about what they should be doing. You know why? Because if they have made a commitment to Christ and saying, He is the leader of this church, then we are going to do whatever Jesus has done. We're going to do what He tells us to do. We're going to look at why He came. And the folks, as we see or saw earlier, Jesus came for one particular purpose, to save a lost world. Then if that's why Jesus came, then that's what we should be about. If I'm committed to Jesus Christ, listen, I, I know for some folks, to, to hear that phrase, their definition of having a commitment to Jesus Christ means they're going to heaven. Listen, it is so much more than that. A commitment to Jesus Christ means that He is first and foremost in your life. You don't make a decision without His input. And folks, He's not your co-pilot. He's driving the train.
If we're going to make a difference in this community with the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's going to require that we are committed to Him, that He's in charge. It's also going to require this, a commitment to the Great Commission. We cannot ignore the fact that after Jesus was resurrected and spent some time with His disciples, He gathered them all up, and He said, I'm getting ready to go, but there's one last thing I want to tell you before I leave. Go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I've commanded you, and lo, I'll be with you to the very end of the age. He said, that's my plan. And then he left. Now, folks, listen. Jesus didn't say, now that's plan A, and if plan A doesn't work, then here's plan B. Folks, there is no plan B. Jesus said to us as believers, as his followers, as disciples, there's only one way to change the world. There's only one way to bring people into the kingdom. There's only one real purpose you have for being on this earth, and that is to go and make mature disciples. We need a commitment to the Great Commission as a church and as individuals. Now, folks, every church should have a disciple-making process. It may be a good one, it may be a bad one, but they should all have one. But let me just say simply simply to you, if a church has a disciple-making process, but at the end of that process there's not mature disciples, then there's something wrong with the process. It's pretty simple. So you know what that means? If we look around as a church and we're saying, hey, we're supposed to be making mature disciples, but we're not, you know what that means? There's something wrong with our process. And that means that we've got to go back and find ways that truly are helping people come into the kingdom. And then once they're in the kingdom, we're helping them become mature in Christ. We need to find effective ways that are doing that. And here's the flip side of that. If we're doing things and spending a lot of energy and money on activities that are not bringing people into a closer relationship with Jesus Christ or not bringing them into the kingdom, we ought to stop doing them. Our focus is pretty narrow, folks. This leads us to a final commitment, and we've been talking about it the whole time, but let's just go ahead and say it. It's going to require a commitment to change. This is exactly what Paul was saying when he said, I became all things to all people. He said, I'm willing to make changes in how I present the gospel so that I can win some. We have to have a commitment to change. Here's what churches a lot of times do. They find a program that works for a while, and it's with them for a while, and they endorse it, and they've had some success with that program. It rocks on for four, five, ten years maybe. But you know what? Over time, it ceases to be effective. But this is what many churches say. Oh, we've been doing that for for ten years now. We can't stop doing that. Can I say something to you just as honestly and just as humbly as I can? If we have a program in place that's designed to produce mature disciples and it's not doing it, that program needs to change. We need to find ways that we can rub shoulders with lost people and then present to them the gospel in such a way where they can respond to it. And folks, what works with one generation will not work with another. I think that's pretty easy to see. Now, you may be saying, well, how do we know when we change things? It's pretty simple. When we stop seeing kingdom results. Let's get specific here just for a second. Folks, it's coming up on here in January, not just a few months. I've been here for five years. And you know what? Our numbers in Sunday school in the five years that I've been here have really never changed. We average about 150 people in Sunday school. It's never really changed. Now, I want to make sure you hear me clearly. Not fussing, not blaming Sunday school teachers or leadership. And folks, if there's any blame, it's on me. For you to be an evangelistic Sunday school type of church, you need a pastor who's emphasizing that. And I've come to the realization that I've not done that. And I need to be a better pastor in that regard. But listen, folks, in keeping with that idea... If our Sunday school program, which we as Southern Baptists have proven is an evangelistic arm, 
It's a way for us to bring lost people into the kingdom. If we've got a Sunday school program and it's not doing that, you know what needs to happen? We need to change some things. Here's another change specifically that we need to make. It's our approach or understanding of ministries. And when I speak of ministries, I'm talking about those opportunities where we're rubbing shoulders with lost people. We're out there in the community. We're doing things. We need to change our attitude towards that to this degree. Yes, let's go out there and paint somebody's house or rake their yard or something like that. Let's do a good thing for someone. But if it's just two people or ten people or whatever, somebody on that team, while the ministry is taking place, somebody on that team goes to that person that we're ministering to, sits down with them and says, let me tell you about Jesus Christ. We have got to get to the point where ministry is just the vehicle that we're using to bring the gospel to a lost and dying world. And let me just say it to you this way, folks. Inviting somebody to church is not telling them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for inviting people to church. Continue to do that. But don't let something good take the place of what is best. And what is best is for you and me when we have the opportunity, without saying I've got all the answers, without saying I'm an expert, just sitting down across the table from someone and saying, let me just tell you about the person who's made the biggest difference in my life. His name is Jesus Christ, and I want you to know the salvation that comes through him. Folks, all of that has changed. And if we're going to be a church that's making a difference in the kingdom and in this community, we have to be willing to change, not just for the sake of change, but for the sake of lost people. We began with a question this morning. Why is this pew empty? As difficult as it's going to be to hear this, I'm going to give you the answer. You know why this pew is empty? Because we want it to be. Now, I know some of you are saying, Brother Robert, that's not true. I don't want this pew to be empty. And listen, I'll be the first one to say, hey, you put me in charge of filling this pew, then whoever is supposed to be on this pew, they got to live with me. You know, I'm going to tell them to get up out of bed, I'm going to tell them to get dressed, and I'm going to tell them to get in the car and they're coming to church. I understand that. But truthfully, folks, if we in our own personal lives, and if we as a church are not organized to the degree where we are rubbing shoulders with lost people, and we're inviting them into a relationship with Christ, then this pew will stay empty and it's because we don't care if it's full or not I need to be a better pastor I need to make sure that the main thing stays the main thing and I'm saying to you that I'm committing myself to doing that I'm thankful for your patience with me and mistakes that I've made here and your love for me. And I know that that's all true. But it doesn't excuse me from being a better pastor. And I'm going to strive to do that. But what about you? Do you need to be a better member? Do you need to, this morning... Come face to face with the fact that if you're not helping the church, if you're not helping the kingdom, then that means you're not concerned about the growth of the kingdom or the growth of the church? Is it possible that you're here today and the Holy Spirit is saying to you, it's time to put your own personal wants aside and your own personal agendas And become all things to all men. I want to challenge you this morning to do that very thing. Would you stand right where you're at? Let's stand together. You see, we've come to a place in our worship service where this is an opportunity for you to make a decision. And folks, believe me, we are asking and the Holy Spirit is asking for a decision.
Will you make the decision this morning to become all things to all men? Will you make the decision to put the gospel of Jesus Christ and your relationship with him at the forefront and make everything else secondary? Let's make sure, let's make sure this is plain. We're not just talking about being a, a better church attender or reading your Bible a little bit more often. We're talking about a relationship with Jesus Christ in which wherever you are and whatever you're doing, inside you're asking the Spirit who dwells in you, Lord, how can I bring glory to you in this situation? It's possible that you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and I think we've made it pretty clear that Jesus died on the cross so that you can receive the gift of eternal life. But there's something that prevents you from just automatically getting that. It's called sin. Yet when we confess our sin, the Bible says he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if you need to make that decision today, we're asking you to come forward. During the invitation, we're going to sing, and if God is speaking to you to accept him as Lord and Savior, you come forward. If you're a believer, you're a member of this church, and God is saying, it's time for you to become a better member. It's time for you to make the transformation of this community a high priority in your life. Maybe you need to rededicate your life to that. Perhaps God is simply saying to you, this is the church you need to be a part of. You need to move your membership here. However God is speaking to you, we're asking that you come forward during this invitation. Don't walk away from this place having said no to the Holy Spirit.